Today, though, we are still in Matthew. It's been four weeks since I spoke, and you guys actually had church closed one Sunday while I was gone, but we're in Matthew 24. Um, This is a chapter in Matthew that has been highly misinterpreted a lot of times. A a lot of times, um, and I can see why, it's very confusing as to what is Jesus actually talking about in these words. What, what, is he talking about the very end times or, or it, uh, the times when, when Jerusalem was destroyed, you know, a couple years after he, he talked about this? So we're going to go through this. I'm going to give you um, my sp- point on it, but I want to view the, the big picture in it. Not the little picture about what was Jesus actually talking about, the, but the picture of what is important. I just shared that it's Jesus first. And when we go through this, again, it's going to be Jesus first. Don't let the things of the world distract you. Jesus first first. So Matthew 24, verse 1. I'm in the NIV, um, and it doesn't really matter what scripture you have. It'll be very close to the same. Uh, Verse 1 starts out, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when the disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. The disciples wanted to marvel at the engineering. They wanted to marvel at the, at the temple. At the buildings at the time would have been magnificent. If we, if we go back and read about how they were built, how long and how wide and tall, they were magnificent. For what they had to build, they would have been outstandingly beautiful. We can't even imagine what they looked like at this time. And the disciples said, look, and Jesus says, don't worry about it. You have me. Don't worry about it. I t- truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down because it simply doesn't matter. It's, verse 3 says, As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be fam- famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are, in the, are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many others. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Here Jesus is actually talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. It was coming 40 years later after he talks about this. They say that if you read um, other um, books about what actually happened in Jerusalem, um, the, the first time when he says uh, not one stone will be left on another is exactly how they described it, actually. They say it looked like it was cultivated fields. Everything was destroyed at the destruction of Jerusalem 40 years later under the Roman rule. They destroyed everything. Not one stone was left on another. And here Jesus is warning you about um, staying firm until the end. The disciples there, all but John, were, were um, persecuted. They were, they were martyrs for what they believed. They died because of what they believed. And Jesus is speaking directly to them at this time. He says, many fake prophets will appear and deceive many people. Many people will come saying they are me, but they are not. Be careful, for I, you know me and you know what I spoke about. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Stand firm, disciples. Stand firm. You know what I have told you. You know what I have said. Now stand firm in it. Don't waver back and forth. Stand firm in what I have said, and you will be saved. Verse uh, 15. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, Um, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. This is once again, he was prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem. The the abomination that causes desolation was a false um, god that was put up in Jerusalem, in the temple. And he says the Christians are to flee to the mountainside. And and in these other 
um, writings that I have read from the time I said the Christians fled from Judea into the mountainside to get away from the persecution. They had listened to what Jesus told them. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. The writings after the, the destruction of Jerusalem say that they had never seen anything like that before. That it was like they were plowed fields. Nothing was left standing. And Jesus warned about it. He prophesied about it. He said, this is coming. Be ready. Do not even stand. On, if you need to go, don't go to your house and grab a coat. Get going because they are coming for you and they are coming for you quickly. They want to end Christ's reign. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. For the sake of those that knew Christ, those days would be shortened. They said that the destruction could have gone on, but for the sake of those that knew Christ, it was shortened. Because they had disappeared. They couldn't find them. There was no point anymore in destroying Jerusalem anymore. It was done. It was finished. So that it was, um, the, the, the days were shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. These verses, though, we could also place them. A lot of um, times we have read that these verses are used in describing the end times. Are they, are they wrong? Are they false? No, but when Jesus was talking here, he, was, he could have been talking about both. But, but when we go back and we see the destruction of Jerusalem, it is identical to the way Jesus described it here. Nothing is different than to how he explained it here. So um, the warnings about the end times, sure, absolutely, it, it will be destructive. But what he was talking about here was about 40 years later, verse 26. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Here now he is starting to talk about the end times, right? The Son of it will be very evident when the Son of Man comes. He's saying here that it's different because I'm not coming like a thief in the night. I'm coming like lightning that you can see from the east and the west. It, it's not going to be hidden. There's no excuses. When I come, you will know it. It'll be very visible. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. When Christ comes, it's going to be unimaginable. It's going to be magnificent, actually. We, a lot of uh, times, we get scared when we think about the end times and about how bad it's going to be. But it's going to be magnificent. And we have to go through this to get to heaven. We have, the world has to go through this be simply because he said so. It's going to be magnificent. Then will appear the signs of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the people of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. He will gather all those that were scattered. He will gather everything back together that was scattered because of Satan. He will gather together, and it will be his. It will be magnificent. You will not wonder, did I miss it? You will not wonder, did he come and I miss it? It will be evident that he came. There's been, <laughs> sometimes I've come home and there's nobody home. Melanie's not home. Cassie's not home. Susan, I'm like, what happened? Did I miss the second coming? But it's not going to be that way. It's going to be evident because it's going to be in the sky. We will see the light shine and we will hear the trumpet blast and it will be magnificent. <clears throat> Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will pass not. That's why we're told to keep the words, to store up the words in our heart, because they will not disappear. These are the words of God, and our God is eternal. Therefore, his words are eternal. 
be careful. Now he starts, now is a warning about being ready. Verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Because remember the disciples asked when it will happen, and now he's answering the second question, when, right? But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handle. One will be taken and the other left. It will be instantly. Two will be in the field. One taken, one left. Which one are you? Are you going to be the one taken or the one left? There's only two options. There's only two options. And it's either you're taken or you're left behind. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. If you knew when a thief was coming, you'd be at the door. You'd probably even have the police at the door waiting. If, the thief, if you knew the thief was coming, you'd be ready for that moment. There is no way the thief would be getting in if you knew when he was coming. Jesus is saying, I, you know I'm coming. The signs are evident. I'm showing you the signs. You know I'm coming back. Are you ready? We will be without excuse in the end because Jesus warned, I'm coming back. Now be ready for me. Are you ready? Are you living the way Christ has asked us to live? Are we changing? Are we repenting? Are we getting closer to him every day? Or are we putting it off? Or are we putting it off? Tomorrow might be too late. Tomorrow might be too late. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will be put in, in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that the servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time, and he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Are you ready? We are the servants. Jesus has given us all authority. He has told us exactly what he wants us to do. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Look out for widows and orphans. Let no unwholesome talk exit your mouth. And the list goes on and on. And I'm not calling you to be perfect, but I'm calling you to try to seek after the Lord. Let it be important for us to be more like him today than we were yesterday. Let it be more important to, about that than the worldly things. Let it be more important to be closer to God than ever before. We do not know the day of his return. We do not know the day when the sky is going to, to be bright and when the trumpets are going to sound. It's going to be glorious for us that know him. For those that don't know him, it says there, there will be mourning. The whole world will mourn because they will know we missed the point. We missed the calling of the Lord. We are all called. He has called us all. There is not one person that is not called to know him. But we have to respond to that calling. We have to want it. We have to seek after it. We have to desire it with our heart. We have to make different decisions in our life than we did before. This is what we are called to do, to love, to love, to love. With the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It will never end. Uh, a lot of us, a lot of places we have thought that hell is temporary. It's not. Heaven is not temporary. Hell is not temporary. Hell is eternal condemnation. Heaven is eternal life with Christ in love. So, so, so it's very, to me, it's very evident that we need to make the choice today. Tomorrow's too late. Today is the day. Actually, right now is too late. It should have been 10 minutes ago, but but the point is, we need to make it decision, and we need to make it daily. This morning when I wake up, I need to say, uh, I'm sorry, God, for, for the thoughts I had last night, for the thoughts I had that, 
Um, you know, when Susie woke up for three hours in my bed, I was angry with her. She doesn't know better. Lord, I'm sorry for this. Please forgive me for the way I, I, I thought about her at the time. And, and we have to do this every morning. We're told to repentance is a daily thing. It's not a thing that we do once and it's done. It's a daily thing. It could actually be a, an hourly thing. Hey, Lord, I'm sorry for the thoughts I had. I'm sorry for, for the things I said to that person before, Lord. I'm sorry for this. I'm Please forgive me for my thoughts or, or the website I looked at or, or the text I sent. It's many, many things, but we are told to, uh, to be in a constant form of repentance and, and wanting to be closer to God than, than we have been before. So um, as we go about this week, let's, let's remember this. It's, it's, it's very clear that it's only one decision in our life that matters, that there's only one thing we need to decide. But let's, let's make this decision every morning. Today, I'm going to live for Christ. Today, I'm going to live for him more than I did yesterday. Today, Lord, please help me to keep my thoughts clean and my thoughts centered on you so I can be your hands and feet for those around me that don't know you. We need to do these things for the kingdom. The kingdom is the important part, right? The kingdom is um, what we are here for, to advance the kingdom of God so that more can be saved and more can know his love than me yesterday. I'm going to pray. Um, we have a chili cook-off um, it's probably the best potluck we have in a year because chili was awesome. Um, um, I, you're all invited to stay. Um, I think there's a set of rules because they want us to taste them all and give a score so that the, one of them actually wins. Um, in my books, they all tie for first. But um, they want us to, to taste them and then give a score and then you can eat as much as you want. So um, I also pray for you as you go home that uh, the gas doesn't get too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your words that um, are your words. They are your written words, and they are here for us to learn and to, and to take in and to want to be more like you than ever before. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for the church as it is. Lord, thank you for the people that come and want to know you, Lord. I pray that um, as we go out this week, we would be your hands and feet in Kindersley and wherever we may be. Um, Lord, wherever we go, we would shine for you, and everything we do would bring you glory. Lord, thank you for the food that's been prepared. Thank you for, um, for all the people that helped to make it and that brought it here, Lord. I thank you for those hands, Lord. I pray that it would be a blessing to our hearts and to our bodies, Lord. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.